Thank you. 
So we've been working on the Disciple Series here over the last, I think about four months now, working through the different disciples, who they were, what they were, what happened to them, where did they die, or who were they martyred, is what we've been doing. We're coming to the close of this. We're on John. Now normally I do John first, and then I do Judas, but I found when I do this series, if I do, when I do Judas last, it leaves you with a negative feeling about the whole series. So that's when I swap from Judas to John. John is one of those people in history that everybody can love. He's that young nephew that you know, the small one, the young gentleman. That's who John was to Jesus. That was his youngest nephew. He loved John. He kept John close. He had plans for John. Just jumping forward a little bit. If you knew you were going to die, and you knew your mother was an elderly widow person, wouldn't you want her to be with somebody you knew would take care of her? That's what John was to Jesus. Okay? That's how much he trusted him. And he kept him close. So we're going to start talking over the next couple of weeks. John takes a little bit longer. He's a very positive person to, to talk about. And I spend a little bit more time on John. So, John was one of the twelve. And if we'll go to the next slide, we'll look at the family tree again. One more slide, Peggy. See, she's doing tech services too. You teach your wife and everybody involved. Okay? So here's John right here. Okay? So this is Jesus' family. This is Jesus' mother. Her, his sister was Salome. The two brothers were James and John. Also, Jude was another, was the son of uh, James. But this is James and this is John right here. So that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about close family here. You know, you probably have a cousin or a nephew or a niece or something like that that's really close to you. Okay? And that's who we're talking about here. I guess that would make him his first cousin, right? Am I saying that right? It's his first cousin, not his nephew. So his first cousin. But he's very young. Uh, John's probably, I guess at this time, somewhere around between the ages of 17 and 19 because we know when he died and about how old he was died. So when you back it up, you can figure that out. Just, just nothing in the Bible says that, but you can kind of figure it out. Okay? So, the youngest of the twelve and the closest to Jesus who lay on his bosom, and it is said, the one he loved. A long-lived, quiet spirit who passing did not receive the heralding that Peter and James. Because what? They were martyred spectacularly in front of a lot of people. Okay? So everybody knows what happened to James and John. You know, people know what happened to these other major disciples. You know, they were taken in the circus Maximus and killed and stuff like this. But John's kind of that quiet person who lives a long life and quietly dies. We'll talk a lot more about that. In all his works, he never mentioned himself. He always talked in the third person. He never wanted the attention on him. He always wanted the attention on Jesus. So when he wrote in all his prolific writings, he never said himself, he would always say the servant of Jesus Christ. He would use the third person. His race was long and finished without ceremony. Embodying Timothy's words, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and honesty. So that's who he was. Now change his name. The next picture up there, you see um, not James. John's name has been taken and used in a lot of different places. It's a favorite in England. Several of the English kings were named after John. So you kind of were one very you get that. I cannot say from the next slide, I cannot say that Jewish word. 
or that Hebrew word. But what it means is dove. Now understand, a Jewish word does not mean a word. It means a thought or a vision. When you think of a, a Jewish word, you have to think of it as in a vision of what they're trying to say. In this case, it's a dove. But that dove, when they see the dove in the Jewish person's mind, is the Lord is gracious, or grace of the Lord. So that's the idea that is embodied in the name of John. Okay? Johannes brought back from the Crusaders and converted into English as J-O-A-H-A-N, or J-O-N, Hence, they finally came down to the name in the English word of John, which supposedly in Greek means the same thing as what the Jewish word means. So where do we first see John? In the Bible, John shows up right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was one of the first to follow Jesus. John, the son of Zebedee. And John 1, 35-37. Again, the next day, John stood. Now, this is John the Baptist. This isn't the young John. This is the guy in the camel's hair, coat, and all that. So, John the Baptist was, was walking with his disciples. And John stood with two of his disciples. And looking on Jesus as he walked, said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak. And they followed Jesus. They were curious. Why is John? See, they all held John at he was a prophet. He was a reincarnation of either Elijah or Elias. So John was a special person. John who ate locusts and he wore camel's skins and he baptized people in the Jordan. They were in awe of John. And here John is saying, in a sense, see this person? He's more important to me than I am. See this person? He's who I came here to tell you about. I'm his herald. And that word, when they use herald, is the same thing as a guy standing up on top of the fort with the silver trumpets, blowing the silver trumpets, heralding the king in. So that's what John was supposed to be. He was not the prophet. He was there to herald in Jesus. John 1, 38 and 39, and Jesus turned, seeing them following, said to them, what do you see? So you can imagine, you walk down the road, there's two people following you, you kind of look back, what do you guys want? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to be translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. So Jesus let them follow him to the house that he was staying at. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Now in the Jewish day, that's late in the afternoon. And the Jewish have a law. I guess it's out of safety in some ways. It depends on what day of the week it is. That after a certain time of day, you're only allowed to travel so far. Okay? Also, remember, putting it in context, they're under the authority of the Romans right now. And Romans have a rule that Jews aren't to be out late at night. If you're out late at night, you're doing something bad. You stay home. Can you imagine if this nation was under the same rule that the Romans had the Jewish under? Well, they were not allowed to leave their house after the sun goes down and it gets dark. Well, these disciples knew that there's no way that they would make it back to where they're supposed to be in the time that it would take before they could get in trouble for traveling on the roads. So they spent the night with Jesus. Can you imagine being one of the first people to be there with Jesus and spend the night talking and just getting to know who Jesus was? Now let's go talk a little bit about his family. Where does he come from? He's a fisher. And I'm not talking about a person with a fishing pole head. No, he is from a family who owns boats and ships and servants. It's a large organization. 
they are in business, and his father is in business with his cousins. So James and John and Peter and Andrew own fishing companies, and they work together and they help each other out, like family should. Okay, so they're out there fishing. So that is the image that we're that we're showing here as they're out there fishing. Matthew four twenty one. And going on from hence, he saw other two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and call, he called them. So this is the first calling. Now, it's not the first time John has seen Jesus because John spent the night, but now Jesus is going, and this is the first place in the Bible is saying that he actually went to them and he called them to join him. Let's get a little more into it. We're going to look at Mark, Mark 1, 19. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in a boat, mending their nets, and immediately called to them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Now, they didn't abandon their father. A lot of people said, wait, wait a minute, they own a fishing business, and they're just going to walk away. No, understand, this is a big organization. They had servants, and the word servant here does not mean slaves. It means people who work hard to come help. So they had these people. So these two guys were the members of a well-off family. Because one of the main food stays was the food, the fish that came out of the Sea of Galilee. So they're walking away and leaving their father with all these servants to continue the business. And now they're going to go and follow Jesus. Luke. If you want to, you can follow along in this one. Because it's going to take a couple minutes. Luke 1 through 11. And so it was that the multitude pressed him to hear the word of God. And he stood by the lake of the Nestor, and he saw two boats standing by the lake. The fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. So they had been out there all night. They fished at night, by the way. And in the daytime, they would come in and they would sort their fish and sell them to the markets and then mend the nets and all that stuff. And Jesus has a big multitude crunching in on him and he's trying to speak to him. Now let me think, think about this. This is how God's wisdom in Jesus, he was still God. He understood things that we probably didn't understand as humans to many hundreds of years later he understood acoustics and how acoustics work. So here he's trying to talk to these people. Have you ever been in a crowd of people and you're in the back and you're trying to hear what somebody said and you just can't hear Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter's, and he asked him to put out a little for land. You see, he knew if he got the boat and he got out a little bit from land, when he spoke, it would go across the water. The water cre creates a, a reverberation, and all the crowd would be able to hear him. He understood acoustics 2,000 years ago. So he understood that by getting out a little ways from that water, he'd be able to do it. And who's he using? He's using these fishermen to do it. And he sat down and called the multitude from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now understand, these guys have been out there toiling and catching fish all night long. They're done for the day. It's morning. They're tired, they're probably hungry. But being fishermen's noticed that they didn't just quit and leave. No, they're in there fixing all the holes in their nets. Maybe their net caught on something on the bottom and it ripped the net. Now they gotta fix the nets before they can leave and go start their go get rest for the day, go get something to eat. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have pulled all night and caught nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, I'll let the net down. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. Think about that. They caught so much fish in this net, as they're trying to bring it in, it's starting to break the net. And they signaled for their partners, James and John. 
in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. These were fishermen. They were professionals. They knew what they were doing. They knew what a good catch was and a bad catch was. They knew when things were good and great. They, they knew what a normal, what you should catch with fish. They're seeing something they've never seen before. They're astounded. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am sinful. I'm not worried about what I look like right now. I want you to understand, I know what I am. Now, I'm a sinful man. I'm a sailor. I cuss and I drink and I do all these things. And he just saw this miracle. He had already heard John the Baptist declare that this was the Son of God. He was scared. Imagine. Here he is in the presence of the Son of God. Knowing the condition his soul was in. He says, Leave, you, just, you need to get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Don't, you don't need to touch me or anything. I don't want you dirtying yourself with me. For he and all those who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon and to them all, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they brought their boats to land, and they forsook all, and they followed Jesus. Think about that, folks. To be put in the presence of God in your current position and condition. Would you be ashamed? Would you at least be self-conscious? I know I would be. Here's the funny thing. We're in that condition all the time. You see, people don't understand. If you were a Christian, Jesus, as the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. You're always with Jesus. Every step you take, every word you speak, the Holy Spirit's inside of you. And I like saying it like this. The Holy Spirit is a direct radio communication to the ear of God. He's with you all the time. When you're doing good, when you're doing bad. When like the other day, that person did something absolutely crazy in front of me in the car and I yelled out at him. God heard that. We can't hide from him. You can go into your room, into your closet, turn the lights out. He still hears you. He still sees you. Peter was scared. Peter knew who he was. So did Jesus. You know what Jesus saw? He saw the potential of what Peter was going to become. Because remember, God is omnipotent. He knows the future. He knows everything that's going to happen. And He knows what you're going to be and what you're going to do. And He's happy for what He sees. For His children. Does that mean that we're not going to stumble and fall and do bad and everything else? Oh, yeah. We're going to mess up. I mess up every day. I'm a school teacher. You know I mess up all the time. But grace is there to forgive us for whatever we do wrong. Before you sin, you are already forgiven. You don't have to live a life of defeat. We're supposed to live lives of power. Why? Because Jesus has already forgiven everything that you're going to do. He already paid for it. He did that on the cross. He wants you, I want you to live life and live it more abundantly. 
over everybody else, above the rest of the world. You're my children. I love you. I want the best for you. We're going to grow right from this into the Lord's Supper. Now, here's the way we normally do the Lord's Supper. And i got to think about this. Ladies, I didn't do something I need you to do. I need you to go up there and get a pair of gloves. Of the blue gloves. Huh? Yeah. Got some back there? Good. Would you bring me bring up some for me? And then, uh, Chuck, would you come help them? Help them? We'll keep our six foot, okay? You get my uh, face mask. Oh, you can take your face mask long, off long enough to take the Lord's Supper, by the way. to talk to the Lord and make sure everything's right with you and the Lord at this minute.
Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. Father, Father, thank you for this day. And thank you of this wonderful representation of what we are to you. That you would give yourself for us. Thank you for the example of John. How John was willing at a moment's notice when his God called to drop everything and follow him. Father, through this taking of this drink here, we're, we're, we're telling the whole world that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's an announcement to the world. We belong to you. We're going to serve you. So, Father, let that be in our hearts and our minds that we're to be servant of our God whenever and for whatever He calls us to do. So, in this time, if you have a need and you just need to come up to the altar and pray, the altar doesn't to you. If there's something you need to speak to your pastor about, I'm available. I'll see you right after church service is over and we'll make time when we can talk. Whatever your need is, if it's just to sit there in your seat while, while she plays, sit in your seat, talk to your God. He's listening. His, his hands to his ear, he's listening for you. He loves to hear from his children. Well, whatever your need is, this is the time for it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
I want to thank you. I want to thank you all that are either on Facebook or YouTube that is joining us this morning. Thank you for being here at Front Neck Baptist Church in Coco Ford. We appreciate having you join in in our services. We hope that this has been a blessing to you. Once again, I'm Bill McKinnish, pastor of Front Neck Baptist Church in Coco I'm going to ask one more thing. If you got something you can play with Snappy, I they need five more minutes down to another kid. We don't care. Your choice. I love, I love old hymns, but I also love modern music. I'm not sure you know this is not a hymn. It's <laughs> okay.
They have several campuses around the state of Florida, and Florida Baptist cares for these children 100%. This diaper drive is because they've got a lot of babies in right now, okay? And they need the diapers. So it uh, doesn't matter which size of diaper you get. Maybe you know somebody that has an extra box that they didn't use somewhere. Bring them and drop them off. We'll get them to the association, okay? All right. Anybody else? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for everything that's happened here. We've had a wonderful time. We've enjoyed the music. Um, everything was just really nice today as far as what you provided. You have blessed. And we want to give back that blessing. We need to continue our worship service. And the way we did this, is God said that brethren should eat together. Aren't you glad? So, Father, over the food that we're about to hand, to go eat. The hands have prepared it down there and they're going to serve it to us down there. I want you to give a blessing over everything we're going to do. As we get to know each other and spend some time together, Father, let's continue our worship service in the bonding of brotherhood. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Please go down to the other end of the fellowship hall. There is food waiting down there for you. Okay.